Uh, Tell them, there we go. Pastor's on now. Okay. When you gonna uh? When you tell me when we're on air? There. We're on air now. Welcome everybody. We're getting the sound all straightened out, but welcome to Wood Lake Baptist Church. Don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. But we're getting it going here, and we're going to start. Okay, what's the number of the first one? Let's see, what were you just doing? 581, is that what you were doing? 581, kids, if you got a Baptist hymnal at home, get that thing out, and we're going to sing about being saved tonight. Y'all ready? All right. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves To every land Climb the steeps and cross the waves Onward tis our Lord's command Jesus saves, Jesus saves Wafted on the rolling tide Jesus saves, Jesus saves Tell the sinners far and wide Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing ye islands of the sea, echoes back ye ocean caves, earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, by his death and endless life, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing it softly through the gloom, when the heart for mercy craves, sing in triumph for the tomb, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. Tears a song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. <laughs> Y'all all right? What is our next number, Miss Kay? <laughs> 584 is that where we are Miss K 489 K bailed us out right here 489 because I had the wrong number there we had the wrong hymn but 489 I know y'all are going to love this one this is an old good one if you don't know it you've missed a big treat for all these years amen y'all ready Lord I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart.
Thank you, Kay. Kay, Kay bailed me out because a lot of times there'll be two hymns, the same name, and I just looked at the words very quickly on the other one. I didn't really look at the music. I was planning on doing that, and Kay texted me and said, hey, Brother Jerry, that's a different tune. And the other one is a lot slower. It says, I want to be like Jesus in my heart I was like that won't work so Kay bailed us out on that one she was checking brother Jerry so and uh there was another one I forgot what it was I want to do it but it had a, it had like two or three DCs in it and I thought I know the tune but we may need to practice that one ahead of time it reverts back a couple of times I hadn't heard it in a long time so I'm actually, uh, you know, and that's pretty good. Kay, we don't even get to practice. We just come in and do it. So we just, we're singing by letter, and we just open my mouth and let her fly. That's how we do it. So, amen. amen. Did y'all have a good week so far? Amen. Good week so far? Welcome, everybody, to Woodlake Baptist Church. We're going to pray here in a minute. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount, so let's, let's jump into that. And our ladies are in the ladies' Bible study. I've got some ladies in here with me as well. We've got a group here. We had a group that prayed at 6 o'clock. We're missing some folks tonight. And, uh, boy, if you don't, you don't realize how, what a blessing it is to have people to do things, others have to jump in and, and help out uh, when folks are gone so that we can get, on the, uh, get online and so that we can have sound and that people can play and do all these things. And so we want to pray for Josh and Amy and their family and McCurdy's. Uh, McClarity's as they are out uh, taking care of, uh, you know, the body of their loved one as she's, she's gone to be with Jesus. Amen. She has gone to be with the Lord. Don't forget, the guys, those of you listening, we have uh, 630 Friday night, and uh, we're uh, going to cook some, some breakfast. We're going to have a good time. And uh, Brother Corey's going to be making some gravy. Miss Wanda's making gravy, too, I found out. So we're going to have two different kinds of gravy. You can never have enough gravy, so it'll be all right. We're going to have Richard Huff's biscuits. We're going to have sausage and bacon and eggs. You, we'll fry them or scramble them. I'll bring my flat top, too. And we're, we're just going to get after it. We're going to have a blast. And so I hope you'll be here. Bring your friends. So we're, we're, we've got about 20 signed up. We're planning on 30, so we'll have some extra food just in case, okay? We're going to have a good time, and I just appreciate y'all so much. And so uh, the women are always eating, so now the boys are going to eat. So, uh, and the women found out that we were having the axe throwing thing with the men. They wanted to go to that. Now the women want to come and get some, some breakfast. And so, no. <laughs> Unless you want to get saved, you can't come, right? You got to stay away. No, no. So I'm just kidding, y'all. You want to get saved, you come anytime you want to. Amen. So I had a great day. Was it a beautiful day today or what? Is God so good? What a beautiful day today. So I slipped off and played golf today because it's going to rain Friday. So uh, we, and uh, I'm tired of playing in the rain, doggone it. <laughs> just like got absolutely soaked the last time we played. And uh, just for, I don't know why I need to say this, but. I beat the daylights out of Charlie and Tony today, so I just wanted everybody in television land to know that. So, (laughs) 
All right, that's good stuff, and they can't fight back. Don't mess with me. I always get the last word. So I tell my family, I'm going to marry you and bury you. I'm the baby. I get the last word, so be careful. Amen? All right, well, let's get into the Word of God. Man, this is some good stuff right here. And uh, if you're out there, you need a good Bible study. The ladies are having a great Bible study. It is just fantastic what's going on in there. They're having a, a blessed time, and so I hope you're enjoying that. Jude, we're preaching through Jude on Sunday morning. And uh, pretty soon we're going to go through 2 John, 3 John, and Philemon. And so uh, outside of 3 John, all those are already finished. So I'll be putting those notes up on, online, and you'll, you'll have all that as well. So uh, it's, it's fantastic. And we're going to pray for our folks here in a minute. Uh, let's see, what is this Sunday? Is this Sunday the 18th, or the, what is this? This Sunday is the 11th. And uh, the next week, uh, Dallas Brown will be here, and he's going to share just a few minutes before the service. We're going to have a regular service so that you can get a good look at him and, so, and get to know Dallas like you know the Brewskis. And so hopefully uh, they feel comfortable when they come home. They're sending churches faith uh, and uh, over by the, the old high school. And so great folks. He's in Burkina Faso, and I just love our missionaries. It's fantastic. So let's pray. Lord, we love you. I ask you to open the, the bread of life to us. Thank you that the universal uh, symbol of sustenance is bread, and Jesus is the bread of life. And so, Lord, feed us with on, not only with his presence, but also with the words that he gave us and help us to understand this, this text as we go through. And in these days, Lord, this is where we live right now. And uh, this is the second uh, message, part two of our message on persecution. So, Father, bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we, we talked about that. The passage is in uh, five, Matthew 5, 10, 11, and 12. And so uh, the, the passage is, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You won't be persecuted for righteousness unless you're righteous. And if you're righteous, that's a good sign that you're going to be persecuted and that you're on your way to heaven. So hang in there. Amen. So <clears throat> then he says, blessed are you when people insult you. How can you be blessed when you're insulted? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, blessed are you when you're insulted, when uh, you're persecuted and you're falsely, people say all kinds of evil against you because of me. There's the, there's the key, because of me. And so that's, that's a thing. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We're not without precedent. They persecuted the Son of God. They're going to persecute us as well. Amen? Now, uh, and here's one of the things I meant. I've got in your notes John Wesley's experience of persecution. John Wesley expected to be persecuted. And John Wesley got to thinking one day, and uh, I get tickled when I read some of these old stories. He was on his horse going to the next town to preach. <laughs> And on his horse, he's going there, and he stopped. He said, I've got to pray. I haven't been persecuted all day. He says, as a matter of fact, I hadn't been persecuted the day before or the day before that. And he said, the revival we just came out of wasn't that successful, he thought. He saw something must be wrong. I haven't been persecuted. And he got down off his horse, and he got down behind this hedge of, of bushes, and he began to pray. Lord, there's got to be some sin in my life. Lord, forgive me because I've not been persecuted. And he said, these two little boys heard him praying and said, that's that, old, that's that old evangelist preacher, John Wesley. And they got some rocks and started throwing at him. And he got happy in the Lord. And he says, thank you, God. I am so grateful that now I know that I'm right with my Lord. He got on his horse and went on to the next, next town. So, you know, th those of us who serve the Lord are going to be ridiculed. You're going to be persecuted. They're going to say, people are going to say things about you. You experience this in your job place. If you're retired, wherever you are, it doesn't matter where you go. If you stand up for Jesus, you're going to get hammered. I'm just telling you, it's just going to happen. And so uh, I uh, watched uh, a, lot of, a lot of times I go through a lot of these uh, websites or I go through Instagram or whatever. There's a creation uh, website there uh, that's not about creation, but it's there to talk about the Big Bang Theory and blah, blah, blah. And they go through and talk about this foolishness. And so I put comments on there. Well, uh, the comment that somebody replied back to my comment, and I put on there, a fifth grader who knows Jesus could, 
could re, 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 you know, could give a rebuttal to everything you have in this video. It's ridiculous. And they talked about the Big Bang and all that. And I put a few comments in there and some scripture. The guy writes me back. Comments that I made, he, he had, well, his comments had nothing to do with what I said. Here's what he asked me. Yeah, but what if God is gay? That was his comment to my remarks on the video. I made a <clears throat> biblical remark, an intelligent remark, and then he comes back, yeah, but what if God's gay? And I says, well, brother, that's blasphemy, and you've put yourself in danger of the hellfire. I just left it. Y'all all right? See, I was nice. I wasn't trying to be rude the second time I answered him, but who would answer something like that, that God is gay? Isn't that something? If you make a statement about righteousness, you're going to get ridiculed. So just hang in there. And so listen, if, if you're, we make it sound like, now persecution is terrible. That didn't hurt my feelings at all. So I don't think that's really t too serious. But there are people in Syria and Yemen and Jordan. There are people in Israel. And there are people who are literally dying for their faith. There are people who are in jail do you know there's people in the United States of America, pastors who's, who homeowners association didn't want them meeting and having Bible studies in their homes who sued them and had them arrested in America. Y'all all right? And so uh, the, this, all this foolishness with you got to have the right pronouns to call people by and all that stuff, what that's leading to is hate speech. They're going to make everything hate speech. And so they're going to have to lock me up from the pulpit when I preach against homosexuality. Uh, I'm, you know, and the preachers today are dancing around the issue. We're not dancing around the issue. The issue is those are sins that we walk away from. Those are sins that we say, no, I'm not calling your daughter he. I'm not going to do that. I know what a woman is. I know what a man is. And we're going to stick with it. We're, going, we're, we're not going to be offensive on purpose, but we're going to stand for the truth. So... Let's look at the first thing, the meaning of, the, the meaning of persecution. What is persecution? Uh, Dioko is our, our word here, and he says to pursue with enmity. So blessed are you when you're pursued with enmity. Uh, to persecute is the little word dioko. It means to prosecute, to persecute, uh, to follow after with repeated attempts to obtain, to go after with, e with earnestness and diligence. Uh, derivatives and synonyms uh, mean to press or to drive out or to crush or to put in distress. Have you ever seen those guys who uh, get the sugar cane, the juice out of sugar cane? They put them in stacks, and Ryan's back there doing this now, and they put them in those big presses, and they turn those things, and they squeeze them down. That's the picture of persecution. There's some pressing down. There's a uh, uh, to, to drive out. And so people come after you to persecute you. And, and here's the key to it all, the word for uh, righteousness. When anytime if you're doing word studies or you see or hear a pastor talk about, uh, and he uses uh, delta, iota, kappa, so D-I-K, deek. And that prefix on any word generally, probably 90% of the time, will refer to righteousness, justice, goodness, uh, veracity, and so this little Greek word for righteousness is uh, dikai sunotes, and it's, it means on account of righteousness or behavior. It means living a right life, being in a state of acceptance with God. Now, that's righteousness when you're in a right state with God. If you're a born-again believer, Jesus is in between you and God. You're in a, you're in a righteous state, so uh, that's and so if you're being, you, for it to be persecution, you have to be persecuted for being righteous. Now, if you do something, Ryan, I'm echoing up here in a little bit too. So uh, um, th there's a, uh, if you're at work and you don't do your job and your boss gets on to you, that's not persecution. <laughs> that's, you're supposed to be doing your job. Y'all say amen. Uh, if, if you're doing something, you get in trouble and you pay for this, the, the bad behavior, or if, you know, well, it's I'm being persecuted because uh, I'm an immigrant or I'm being persecuted because, because I'm tall or I'm being, you know, 
no, you've just been dis disobedient and uh, you're breaking the laws in your office and everybody falls under the same law. So when we're persecuted, we can't say, oh, I'm just being persecuted because I'm a Christian. No, you, ha you as the Christian should obey the rules more than everybody else. I have a terrible problem <laughs> with that. <laughs> so, Y'all pray for me. Uh, you can't park there, sir. Why not? <laughs> and so I'm having to learn to just obey the rules. Amen. Uh, so insult or reproach. So blessed are you when you're insulted or you've been reproached. The, the little Greek word here means to, to revile or heap insults upon. Have you ever been, you ever been insulted because you're a Christian? You know, I love it. I love it when somebody calls me goody two shoes. I, holy roller that's another good one i wish in jesus name that i could somebody could see something in me that was holy enough to call me holy roller i love it i'm not a holy roller i'm a sinner and i'm very well of the f fact that i'm a sinner and uh I, I need the lord to help me so you can insult me all you want to but i know who i am in christ and so these little uh, epitaphs and uh, criticisms and names that they call us. And so uh, some people have said, well, now, Brother Jerry, I, I try my best not to call people names. So I use the term homosexual, uh, and I will use the term queer because that is the term they use for themselves now. But uh, I don't make jokes about it. I don't call people names. I tell them the truth. I want them to understand this is not a game. It's not a joke. I'm not making fun of you. I'm telling you the truth in Christ that you, you're you doing something that is, uh, you know, not like our president, former president of the SBC, who dodged around all the questions about Romans chapter 1. And so Romans chapter 1 is very clear about what's male and what's female and that men go with men and women go with women. I mean, men go with women and that's the way it is, period and that we don't do things that are abomination unto the Lord. Uh, our former president dodged around all those questions. And so it was, uh, and he's still doing it today. So, and then they say evil, poneron is the word. It means evil. Be very careful that you don't slander people in this way. And so do you remember this? Here was the lesson that we learned in Jude when I preached this a few weeks ago. And I didn't understand this, and a lot of other people don't, when he says, don't that Moses uh, or Michael didn't argue with the devil about the body of Moses. He didn't bring a slanderous accusation even against the demons or against Satan himself when he was trying to get. He said, the Lord rebuke you. And here's what we learned from that was that the Lord knew that even if we began to slander bad things, that we would get into a habit of doing that. And before you know it, we would be slandering good things. And so the Lord doesn't want us to slander anything whether it be good or bad, so we don't get into a habit of doing it. Just say, the Lord rebuke you. Let the Lord handle that. And, and by the way, Satan is way more powerful than we. His demons are more powerful than we. So don't talk to them. Don't rebuke the demons. Stay away from them. Just talk to the Lord. Amen? Have you ever heard people pray it, and Father, we love you, and, and we rebuke the devil in the name? Why would you stop talking to God to talk to the devil? There was two people in the Garden of Eden that did that, and they got in trouble. Don't talk to him, and you can't get confused by him. Just let him go on about his way. And then they say things that are false about you. So uh, falsely, someone uh, several years ago, maybe it was about, I guess about four or five years ago, uh, came to the deacons and told them that uh, they said they uh, were at a restaurant somewhere close down by Sanford's house and that they heard all these things about Brother Jerry, okay? very slanderous things, very damaging things if they were to get out in public. And they described all this stuff. And then this person said, well, I heard them doing this behind me, but I couldn't see who they were because the booths were real high, okay? So they did all this kind of stuff. And so I said, well, I'll be glad to talk with you, with them in my office so we can all look together in each other's face. They wouldn't do that. So I says, well, tell me this again, how this works. They said, yeah, but they, I said, well, who was it that said it so we can confront these folks and put all this out on the table? And they says, well, they couldn't see them because the booth was so high. Well, it so happens that 
we used to play every third Friday at the Oaks. And every third Friday, we leave the Oaks, we went to that restaurant. There are no booths in there with high backs. I went over to her and said, look at this, let me show you this. There's absolutely no way possible that somebody could sit behind you and you not turn and look and see who they are. The booths were this tall. I said, they're lying. They just made it up. They just made it up, completely made it up. Someone else came forward and said, I know that person. They lie all the time. They do that to pastors all the time. You see what I'm saying? People are going to persecute you. And this was some folks that had gotten mad and left the church. Why would you do that to me? It was, it was wicked things too, like here's what your pastor does and this, that, and the other. And I know things about his family and all this kind of stuff. And they said, we didn't say that. Now, we heard the people behind us saying that. Y'all all right? Lying. Just point blank, out and out, falsely lying. Uh, Johnny Hunt tells a story one time of sitting in an Applebee's somewhere, and he and some men were having a luncheon. And then all of a sudden, the bartender came over and set a beer down in front of him and said, on the house. He said, didn't order that. He said, the guy at the bar ordered it for you said tell you this one's on the house they looked nobody's at the bar why would somebody do that to Johnny Hunt why, why would you do that just rude just this. so people are going to persecute you they're going to say lies about you they're going to say things that aren't true unfortunately if you're in the ministry those things can really hurt your ministry because there's always people that will believe things that are just simply not true uh, the mystery of persecution. Now, this is just so cool. Here is, he says, rejoice in it. Well, this is an imperative, by the way, in the original language. <clears throat> and he says, it's a present active. That means do it now, and you do it. You rejoice. It's a command. It's a command that we rejoice in persecution and when people lie about us. Now, if, if my life had not been something to attack, worth attacking it wouldn't have been attacked. If I wasn't causing Satan, the devil, some problems with trying to live righteously, I wouldn't have been attacked. Rejoice, he says. That's very difficult because you know what I wanted to do? I know who said it, okay? I'll knock on their door. But now let me tell you what I have done. I found two people on Facebook. I was just looking on Facebook one night, found these two people talking back and forth about me and Woodlake and what they were saying was horrible and lies so I just instant messaged both of them and I said you both ought to be ashamed of yourself you're both a bunch of gossips and you're sitting here publicly dragging my name and the church through the mud I want to tell you that conversation got nipped just like that it was very quiet then guess what else I did y'all don't believe this I, I was very nice, but I said, what y'all are saying is lies and gossips. And you're gossiping out in public on this. I called their pastor. I said, let me give you some information about what these two ladies did. And sent them the stuff. I said, I'd like for you to know what you got in your church right there. Maybe you need to sit down and discipline them about trying to tear down the kingdom of God somewhere where they're not even there. Y'all all right? See, confrontation will stop that. The Lord said rejoice in it. So be glad. It means to rejoice. That's also an imperative. He says, he uses the, the word reward. There are rewards for righteous living and rewards for enduring persecution. God has promised that if you endure persecution, you will receive a reward. And so the mystery of it is that we go through persecution and pain and that God prospers us in the persecution. Now, that's very difficult, but I'll tell you, this is why you want to just walk with Jesus. You want to build a life of character so that when you get attacked, you stand on your character. Y'all all right? If I talk to someone and meet them, and they find out I'm a pastor, and they begin to trash their pastor, guess what? I'll call the pastor and tell them. Yeah. <laughs> I know what it's like to be accused of doing things that you don't do. And that's unfortunate for people to do that. And so 
I will say, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to go sit down with your pastor and work this out. And so uh, there was a man who left here very angry, and I had told him his problem was arrogance. I said, you're, you're arrogant. You need to get this straight. This is interfering with your life with the Lord. I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Well, he left the church. He went and talked to his, a friend of his that was a pastor. I have so much respect for his pastor. His pastor said, you need to go back and find out why your pastor told you that. <laughs> and guess what? He did. And we sat down and we worked it out. So the identity, listen very carefully to this, the identity that we have with, with Christ in suffering proves to us that we belong to him. If you've never been persecuted and you're not going to be persecuted, you're not in ever persecuted for righteousness sake, you probably don't belong to Jesus. It identifies us because as soon as the hireling gets persecuted, he leaves. When the wolf comes, he doesn't defend the flock. If you have a pastor that's defending the sheep, he's a true man of God. He's going to stick in there with you. So we identify with Jesus. This is the bliss and the reality in the truce. Righteousness, persecution, and reward all live in the same house. When you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, it will bring joy to your life in some way or the other, and you will be given rewards in heaven. So first, let's make sure. Pink says this, author Pink says, about the mystery of persecution. First, make sure that you're suffering for righteousness' sake in Christ. Those who are morose, haughty, selfish, and evil speaking have no right to seek comfort from this beatitude. When people retaliate against them, know it is where Christ's likeness of character and conduct is assailed, where practical godliness condemns the worldly ways of empty professors and fires their enmity, where humble yet vital piety cannot be tolerated by those who are devoid of the same. The wicked hate God's holy image and those that bear it. So when you're persecuted, you've struck a nerve with somebody because they're doing something ungodly. You with me? Second, persecution's a blessing. We become aware of the fact that we can't stand one hour without the grace of God. I need the Lord to bless me. I need God to hold me up. We become aware of our infirmities and our failures under attack. We're made conscious of our failures, flaws, and fragilities. Listen, the first time you're criticized, go to the prayer closet and ask God if it's true. Now, that's hard. <laughs> when someone says, you were rude, go to the prayer closet. Say, Lord, Father, get by yourself. Say, God, was I rude? If you're convicted, apologize. Point blank. Go ask for it. God, listen, one thing your enemies will do occasionally is tell you the truth. When, <laughs> when God's teaching you submission and humility, he'll make you go apologize to your enemies people that hate you that's hard that's hard but I'm telling you that's a character builder we're kept from sin when persecution comes Do you know that we hunker down when persecution comes we're less likely to fraternize with the enemy yeah so if you around the office or you own your job or something you're being tempted and then all of a sudden you get persecuted by the group you have a tendency to follow it'll straighten you up Jesus said that if the world hated him, they would hate you as well. He says that in John 15, 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first, Jesus said. So it gives us an opportunity to display our faith and to trust in God. We display courage. We display constancy and fidelity to the truth when we endure. When you endure the persecution, it proves that you trust God and you just keep plowing on. Uh, this is the honest goodness truth. I tell you as honestly as I can. I call the Spirit of God as my witness. If people who said things about me because they were influenced by other people, two years to three years after that, called me on the phone. Can I come by and talk to you? I said, yeah, come on. They come by and they sit across from my desk and they say, Brother Jerry, I want to apologize. I believe some things that people said about you. I've been, I was hurt. I, would, I said, you know what? And we end up on our knees in the floor in my office. And I say, I love you. You got, you got influenced by the wolf. And I forgive you. One person I went, they worked at the library. I went to the library. I walked in the door. 
she almost began to cry. She said, I'm so sorry, I can hardly look you in the face. I said, I love you. I want you to come to church with me. <laughs> Rest, it's called restoration. You know why? Because Jesus Christ came and got me. He was persecuted, and, and I, I wasn't with him, but he came and got me. John, he says, many that persecute believe that they're doing God a service. Do you know that? That is crazy, isn't it? Jesus, in, John 14, in John 16, 1 through 4, all this I have told you so that you'll not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that they're offering a service to God. They will do such things because they've, they've not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when the time comes, you'll remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. The words that I just spoke to you are not that important right now. Do you understand what I mean by that? Our country's in bad shape, but we're not getting our heads cut off right now. But the words that I just read, the words that I just spoke, one day in America are going to be very important. People are going to be killed in this country. When Jesus raptures the church, the people that come to know Christ during those tribulation days will be martyred for their faith. Before, right before those times. In these days, we're going to be persecuted in such a way. So we're united spiritually with other people, especially believers in our church, who've been and are being persecuted. Pink says that it, it's given to all to suffer, but that it is a, a special lot to his ministers. He speaks of Moses. Moses was reviled. Samuel rejected. Micaiah hated. Do you remember in 1 Kings, we were there, and he says... The king says, send me a prophet. He said, well, we have a prophet here to seek the Lord's will. He said, Micaiah. He said, I don't want to talk to Micaiah. Ahab said, I want to talk to him. Every time he prophesies against me, he says bad things about me. He said, I don't want to talk to him. And then the king ended up losing his life because he didn't do what the prophet told him to do. And what did he do when, when he prophesied against the king? He said, here's the word of the Lord. He put him in jail. So Nehemiah was opposed and defamed. Stephen was stoned. John was cast in prison. Uh, James was beheaded. And Jesus Christ was crucified. Although you have, you have all you want already, you have become rich. You've become kings. And without us, how I wish that you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of a procession like men condemned to die in an arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are so wise in Christ. Ah, Paul is using a little bit of sarcasm right there, right? We are weak. You're strong. We are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our hands. And when we're cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. And when we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we've become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. Where do you fit, uh, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus in there? Have you ever heard people say that to you? Well, you won't ever do without it. God will give you everything you need. I got news for you. That's not in the Bible. He's talking about money there. My God will supply your needs. You know what you may need? You may need to go hungry for a while. You may need to go without clothes for a while. That's the truth. We, we take the scriptures and manipulate them. The context of that passage in Philippians is about money and how the people uh, provided for Paul in his need. But, but let me tell you, God will eventually supply all your needs. But sometimes the best thing for me is to go without so that God can teach me. You know, we're, we're people that don't get it. We, we have to be awakened. And the best way for God to awaken me is, is when you're in perse being persecuted, your health. What's the quickest way God gets your attention? What's the quickest way God gets your attention? I know for me, you, you're in the financial trouble. Boom, all of a sudden, wait a oh, whoa, what's going on? 
God will get your attention through your wallet. I guarantee you, he can get your, he will take things you will need. How many times have you withheld things from your children to teach them a lesson? The thing that you needed was not what you had. He, you took something from them to teach them a lesson. Does that make sense to you? So I don't want you to think that I'm saying that God doesn't help us or supply our needs, but he says he supplies our needs, what? According to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So taking something from you or withholding blessings may be what is according to his riches and glory to get your attention. I know that I've got a thick head. How many, in the South, your daddy will call you a knothead. Y'all remember that? Do you, how many of y'all? Sanford, that's a southern term. Y'all remember that? Come here, knothead. I didn't know what that meant till I did some chainsaw work on a, on a log. And when you hit a knot and it tears up your, your chain, that's a knothead. That's a knot. And the knot on the tree, that's the hardest thing on the tree. That's where the, the limbs come out. That's where the knot is. My dad say, knothead. God knows I'm a knothead. So the bliss of persecution. Number three, Pink says the Lord Jesus here in Matthew 5 pronounces a blessing and ha happy are those who through devotion to him would be called upon to suffer. They're blessed because such are given the unspeakable privilege of having fellowship with the sufferings of Jesus Christ. The sufferings with Christ is what identifies with you with him. You learn things in this time of persecution and suffering that you never would. In Romans 8, 18 and 19, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. When we're persecuted for Christ, I'm telling you, it brings something out in you that, that can't be, I mean, it's like cracking an egg. You just cannot get to the good stuff inside until you break that shell. And the Lord takes us and breaks us and, and brings that out. We know that we, we are suffering for Christ's sakes. We are we're to know that he suffered for us. And, and we should rejoice in the fact that we suffer with him. Philippians 1.29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now you hear that I still have. Paul says, I'm enduring these things. I'm going through these things. Uh, I mean, I have been to the place at times where I thought, Lord, you built me up through all of these things to get me to this point just to break me down again, just to see how much it would take to break me down because I walked with you and got mature in my faith, and then you broke me down again to start all over again. I'm like, I, I just don't like that, and this is not funny. <laughs> and, Lord, this is tough. Y'all all right? Joel Osteen will not tell you this. This is the scripture. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we don't lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. God didn't put me here just to make me happy. He put me here to make me holy. And he's going to put me through whatever it takes to make me holy. God's more, and more concerned with holiness than anything else. That's hard to understand for our light and momentary troubles. Wait a minute. This is not, this is not momentary and it's not light. But from God's perspective, he's saying this is light and momentary. We've got eternity to live together. And the bliss that's coming, your troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. If that's the case, then I deal with, you know, and it's not as if God keeps us in persecution, keeps us in trials. But man, there's been plenty of saints that have been persecuted and put in jail and prison and stayed there. Think of Bunyan and all that he went through and what came from it, the Pilgrim's Progress. As a matter of fact, Paul the Apostle was in chains and in jail. And he thought, and I, and I can tell you, and this happens to me, and I've seen it over and over again. Lord, you, I could do so much more if you would remove this out of my life. Y'all all right? I guarantee you, Paul said, Lord, you got me chained to a wall. Paul had probably no idea that because he was chained to a wall, he was going to have to write letters and send those letters to the churches to encourage them. And what happened to those letters? They end up in the Bible that millions upon millions of Christians were going to, to use as resources. And so it's, a, it's an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is seen, well, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. God did things in Paul's life that he didn't know what was going to happen. 
And then now, look here, we all have our scriptures. We are, we are brought into fellowship with other sufferers. They persecuted the prophets before me, he said. If somebody attacks Wood Lake Baptist Church, we become closer. I had time and time again, I'll give you a great example of this. I've seen a family that's about to be just burst apart at the seams. They're about to have a divorce, they're about to fall, and then a crisis happened in the family, and it fixes everything. Boop. You're like, whoa, what happened right there? God used persecution or a crisis to bring them back together. So uh, in persecution, we see the power of God on us. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 41 and following, I put these here, you just go read them. Uh, flogged and saved by Gamaliel, the apostle left the Sanhedrin rejoicing, the apostles did, because they were counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from the house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, they were being persecuted. What were they doing? They were singing in there, praying, singing hymns to God. And other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake. And all at once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains were loose. The jailer wakes up and he says, oh my goodness. If you lose your prisoners in that day, you, 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 were, you got killed, you died. And Paul says, hey, it's all right, we're all here. And then he took him home. He and his house were saved. Uh, the mystery and the bliss of, of persecution illustrated 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and following. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial that you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Rejoice. It identifies you with Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of the glory and of God rests upon you. So when you get insulted for the name of Christ, you know, hey, the spirit of God is resting on me. And then he says, if you suffer, it shouldn't be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind, or suffer, but suffer as a Christian. Don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear the name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who don't obey the gospel of God? If it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will it be for the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will. Amen? If you suffer, it will be according to God's will if you're walking with him. Commit yourselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Commit yourself unto the Lord. When you're in the midst of the battle that's going on, I remember when I first became a Christian after about two years of going through all these trials, these tough stuff happening, and God was just had so many vices in my life to get rid of. And I couldn't figure out what are we doing. I mean, you know, my goodness, my, you know, but there's this, when you're going through difficulty, there's this providential, mysterious, spiritual blessing that God just, you just get it in your mind. I'm not quitting. I'm just going to go, man. I'm going to stay with this. I know that I'm saved. I'm not the person that I used to be. I don't know why God's doing this, but I'm going to trust him. And he's going to make me a better person. And I went through some things, I'm telling you. And then and when the time period over the a year's time period that the Lord was calling me into ministry. I didn't understand what was going on. Uh, and I've learned since then that many of the men that I know who have called into the ministry struggle with their calling. They doubt their salvation. I didn't understand that. But over the years now, I've counseled all these young men that come in and say, Brother Jerry, I just I feel like God's calling me into ministry, and I, but I'm doubting my own salvation. How can this be? I said, the, the drawing of the spirit that's that powerful is very much the same. Why did I go through those things, y'all? Why did I go through that? So that I could talk to those young men. Why are you going through the trials that you're going through today? So you can talk to others, right? Uh, from my job to my marriage to many other things in life. You know what will happen to you? Let me tell you, the one thing that's happened to me through persecution and trials and difficulties and, and God just changing me spiritually, God will humble you down. And I'm much more accepting of people who are in the midst of trials. You know why? Because I've been there. 
and I know how painful it is, and I know how confused they are, and I know how much they hurt because they want, they want God to just step in and fix it. And God's doing a work that you can't see, I promise you, with all of my heart. So the reaction of Paul to the suffering and the persecution in his life must have accomplished all that God wanted them to because that those trials did because of the forgiveness and love that Paul showed to all that had deserted him. Now, now listen, now watch this. This is what I'm talking about right here. 2 Timothy 4.19. Listen to how Paul puts this. Do your best to come to me quickly. Paul is dying. This is at the end of the book in 2 Timothy, and Paul is dying. He's in a place. And man, it just breaks my heart. He, he says what he says right here. He's writing, and he says, Come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. One of Paul's side-by-side sidekicks that he has discipled and done these things, he deserted Paul. He left him. Paul, Paul gets in jail, and he, just, he left him. And so Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke's the only one with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. Do you remember what happened to Mark? Mark was a younger man. He went home from the mission trips. He bailed out. He bailed on Paul. You know how many times people I've raised up and worked with, they bail on me. They bail out. There's nothing more painful. And you want to go strangle them. You want to whoop them. You want to take them to the woodshed. Y'all with me? And, and then the Lord says, remember? Listen to how sad this is. When you come, bring my coat that I left at Carpus at Troas. I'm cold. I'm an old man. Bring my scrolls. Bring my Bible when you come. Bring me some word, and especially the parchments. He said, bring me my books, and especially bring me some parchments. I got stuff to write, and I want to read the scriptures. Bring my books. Alexander, the metal worker, he did me great harm. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposes our message. At my first defense, no one came and supported me, but everyone deserted me. What was God teaching Paul? Trust God. He's enough. May it not be held against them. Wow. Jerry Gray's praying, Lord, whoop them every one. Whoop every one of them. Damn bunch of sorry rascals. Paul says, Lord, don't hold it against them. They're weak in their faith. They, don't, they, they can't do it. They, they didn't have any strength. I love this. But the Lord stood at my side, and he gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear. See, Paul had a bigger calling in his life than his life. He knew God called him to share the message to the Gentiles. And so Paul went from place to place being a missionary. He had no idea. I, I, there's no way that he could have seen into the future unless God just told him what was going to become of the New Testament church and that Jerry Gray in 2022 would be preaching and teaching the letter that he sent to his friend. I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and he'll bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. May it not be held against them. God is more concerned, and this is the key, with who we are than what we do. And I, after 35 years, I still struggle with this. You know, I say, Lord, if I didn't have this in my life, I would have time to do this. If you would remove this physical infirmity, Lord, I would be able to do this. And God, if you would, if you would bless me financially here, then I would have the money to help these people, and I would have the money to do this. And Lord, if you would do this and this and this and this. And God says, Jerry, what you do will never be as important as who you are. I got the rest of it. I'm dealing with you. My plans will be accomplished. You, however, I'm fitting into my plans. You're not fitting me, Jerry, into your plans. So may the Lord Jesus Christ comfort you and every Christian in their sufferings. The world puts it like this. The world says, oh, the hatred that I have for God and his plan for suffering. He's persecuted the world with punishment and pain. God has robbed the world of pleasure, and he's caused 
the very world we love to turn on humanity. The life of suffering that I have will never lead, will never let me accept God as my Savior. I would rather go to hell than to believe that God is benevolent. Millions of people will go to hell because they don't understand suffering. They don't understand trials. They don't understand pain. But we know the scripture teaches this. Oh, the joy of submitting to my Savior, my suffering Savior. As I, as I learn to live a righteous life, it identifies me with the suffering Savior. Savior. His life is seen in me, and all that I hold dear is but waste when compared to the bliss of persecution for the message of the gospel. The momentary pain, the pain of persecution will give way to eternal glory and the promise of joy unending in the presence of my Lord. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for the kingdom of heaven is yours. Amen. That's a good word. That's a tough word, but it's a good word. And don't get me wrong. A lot of people will say, well, Brother Jerry, you're just a masochist. No, I'm not a masochist. I'm just telling you the spiritual truth. I don't go looking for trouble. Matter of fact, I don't even pray for patience. Y'all all right? Uh, <laughs> patience brings about tribulation. I don't want any tribulation. I'm not looking for any trouble. And when everything's going well, praise the Lord. I love it. Y'all all right? But when it does come, my first response is supposed to be, I got to get me a shirt. Corey, I thought about this. I got to get you and make me a shirt. This is so silly, but it's true, I'm telling you. I'm going to get me a shirt that says, pray about it. Just pray about it. And people say, what are you talking about? So I have a tendency, maybe y'all, when things are not going well, to, to just fuss about it. And I was fussing about so I'm telling you, it's humanity. And I'm, not, I'm your pastor, but I don't have any wings or anything like that. And so, you know, like for the longest time, my truck, the, the blower won't come on. The air works fine, but the blower won't come on. And so I slammed the door and the blower comes on. It's the biggest redneck truck there is on the planet. So, But I'm in this thing now. See, I wanted to go buy a new truck, and I saw the prices, and I, and I do need a truck. And I thought, I ain't doing it. And then I, and I went to go get a truck, and the Lord convicted me. He said, you didn't even ask me about that. You ain't buying anything. And I got convicted, and I confessed my sin. I said, Lord, I'm not going to buy a truck till you tell me to. So I've been bandaging this one up, right, with bailing wire and duct tape right so now it's become an obsession to see how far we can go with this raggedy truck and uh, then I realized there's so many people I got a better truck than they do so then I, I went to get in it and I left it the night before the blower wasn't on I drove home I was soaking wet it was nasty and the Lord says why don't you pray about it instead of complaining about it pray about it so so I stopped and I said, Lord, it ain't a big deal, but I really would appreciate you making a blower come on because it is nasty. And I don't want to be soaking wet when I get to work. I got in it, cranked it up. The blower didn't work. And I thought, well, Lord, I'll take what you give me. I opened the door and slammed it, and the blower came on. My truck got cool. So I'm going to get me a shirt, Brother Corey. You may say, pray about it. And people are going to see that shirt and they're going to say, what are you talking about? I said, let me tell you a story. I have a terrible sin in my life of complaining when things don't go my way. And, from, and I'm going to learn. I'm going to get this. I'm going to say, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to pray about it. Will that change everything? No, but it changed me. If, Lord, if I prayed about it and it stays this way, you intended for this to be this way. And if not, maybe you just intended for me to grow up through that. Now, that's hard word. That's easy to say right now. Amen? All right, let's pray for our list and everybody online. It's good to have y'all with us. And uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. I'm praying for you too. And uh, we just love you. And hopefully you'll get a chance to come. And our folks in California and Michigan and our folks overseas in Romania, the Brewskis and, and uh, Dallas and his folks in Burkina Faso, they're here in the States now, but we love you. And we're so grateful to be a part. Jonathan and Mandy, we're so great to be a part of your life. So, Father, we love you. I lift this prayer list to you. I thank you that the word's been taught with the students and the children. I thank you for Brian and Jesse. Thank you, for uh, Father, for 
uh, this, the students. Thank you for the children, for Charlie and Selena. Thank you for Miss Joanne and her class. Thank you for Sanford leading into prayer time at 6 o'clock. Lord, for our folks that uh, are here, our missionaries on this list, we just pray you give them fruit for their labor so they can be encouraged. Uh, thank you for our church and each and every ministry that we have and those serving in the local community uh, and our military and all the folks that are they're here to care for us and minister to us that are always there to help us in times of crisis. And for the people that we've prayed for that need a life change, that just need salvation, and those who are uh, ministering to our kids and Lord, just protect them as they go to school every day. And our folks who have had surgeries or someone felt the need to put their name on this list because they are praying for their physical infirmities. And Lord, as we, we've learned that even in Second John and, and Third John, that Lord, you care about not only our spiritual lives, but our physical lives as well. And so I just pray for each and every name, every person on this list, and always specifically for the folks who have cancer, that are dealing with so many difficult things, and our senior adults who have helped us so much uh, that are homebound and can't be here. We lift them to you. And then, Lord, I want to thank you for each and every person over the years that has uh, ministered to me and helped me, especially during my early Christian walk, to understand the sufferings of Christ and persecution and even trials and testing from the Lord to help me to grow spiritually. And Lord, these things are so difficult. Give us that mysterious, powerful, spiritual protection and grace as we go through difficult times. And even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless y'all. That's the quickest hour of the week right there. Boom, it moves, doesn't it? It moves. Amen.